The difficulty with a movement is that it's organic. And so there's lots of different elements to a movement and there isn't necessarily, it's kind of like what they were talking about the Freedom Convoy. That was a people's movement. So the media tried very hard to identify certain leaders, but when it's organic like that, you know, people are coming together because they're like-minded and they're, they're trying to affect a change that they all kind of agree on. They may disagree on how they should do it, but they agree on the ultimate outcome. And that is what the, the Green Movement, the transnational progressive movement is. And the Green Movement is part of it. Um, businesses are a part of it. The environmental organizations are a part of it. The financial industry is a part of it. And it's grown over time. And they all agree that they want to do some kind of change to how the world operates. They don't like capitalism. They think it's a problem. Um, and they all agree our system needs to change. Now they disagree on what it ought to change into. So you have fellow travelers, you've got the opportunists, the businesses who think, well, I need to jump on the bandwagon, otherwise um, I might get excluded or whatever. And then there's others who are ideologically driven, who have a certain specific outcome they want. Um, and so the, the green movement is a part of that. And what I think is interesting is the philanthropies that support it and why. And if you look at what their various missions are and whatnot, they talk about system change. And, you know, there, it's been in the works for a long time. And the movement has shifted over time and different players have come in, some have left and so on. And the, the thing is, they all want to change something they want to change our system, they don't like our system, but they disagree on what it should be. And so what I tried to do was identify the different streams of what they wanted and what are the things they had in common, what things do they agree on. And um, what's interesting is the development in the think tanks, the academics, and you have things that start in academia eventually make their way into the corporate world because a lot of the people who get hired in the corporate world have been educated in the university system. And they, so these ideas start to permeate the, the corporate world. And then you have the corporate world singing from the same song sheet and wanting to do certain things. And you have the tech industry wanting to do certain things, trying to capitalize on, uh, on their part of the movement. Mm -hmm. And there's different coordinating groups and those have shifted over time. So, you know, in the early days you had the Club of Rome doing their thing and then they kind of petered out and became very discredited to some extent, especially during the Reagan years. And then after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there, there was this hope and optimism that the world was peaceful and everything was gonna be okay. and then you had the acceleration of, of the sort of global warming, climate change thing. 2008, we had the financial crisis and there was a real, they believed the, 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 the transnational progressive movement, and I include the Center for American Progress and various other groups involved with this. Um, they held conferences such as the Great Transformation Conference. And it seemed like they were at this point, this inflection point that they could actually make this stuff happen. And after the financial crisis, once Obama became uh, president, there was lots of initiatives to have a green recovery. South Korea probably did the most, but other countries eventually couldn't. They couldn't do it or didn't do it, whatever. Um, the United States threw a lot of money towards solar companies like Solyndra and wind farms and so on. But that money kind of died out too. And Obama wanted to do a really big climate plan, the cap and trade. And you know, John Podesta was like, we tried really hard, but it, we just couldn't get through Congress and so on. So there was still resistance there. And at the Great Transformation Conference, Tom or Homer Dixon from Canada made the case that um, we can try to do all this, but you need a culture shift. And so that there had to be a real concerted effort to change the culture. And that's when we have the rise of social media. If you think how long we've had, um, 
Instagram or Facebook or MySpace, <laughs> I guess at the time, or whatever, you, you start to have social media having an impact and being able to organize people. And the left has been very good at using social media in order to organize people and um, initiate activism and so on. Yeah, that's a very good description. So sometimes politicians are involved in in trying to shift the system. Um, certain Obama officials were involved in various conferences and so on, um, in various meetings and stuff. But how you shift pop the, the politicians who may be reluctant is to have that appearance of grassroots, the people want this. And politicians are very susceptible to negative PR campaigns. So there was an interesting conversation at the um, Network for Greening Financial Services, the NGFS, where they had created their program for the, um, having metrics for the financial industry and uh, for climate change. And they had a representative from the World Wildlife Fund there. And the bankers, this is a bunch of bankers, were like, Oh, we really, we're really curious to see and we're anxious to see how you receive our, our proposals here because the, um, the, the sort of last thing we want is you guys chaining themselves to our gates. And there was like this titter of laughter and the World Wildlife Fund, Fund guy said, oh, I wept with joy when I read your program. This is so great. The world will be saved and you won't have to worry about us. <laughs> And I was thinking, that's part of the problem, where you have bankers and politicians who are afraid of the Stephen Gibos who might show up at their door, chain themselves, glue themselves to your road or your window or whatever, and, and be an embarrassment. And instead of standing up and saying, that's, that's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you shouldn't be doing that. And I disagree with your tactics and your antics. Instead, they... I think the activists get emboldened because they see it works. Right, the rebels, right, they're rebels. So we, we champion the rebels kind of thing. And what's interesting about modern media, at least in the past, I would say five or six years, is that there's a, um, how do you word it? When, when a story, it gets magnified. So the one story gets printed in one place like say project syndicate then they have a whole group that amplifies it around the world and so suddenly you'll see that same story show up in 20 different publications around the world that are part of that network part of the syndicate and so then it seems like oh my gosh this is all over we should be doing these kinds of things and so when an activist does something that gets amplified and magnified around the world amongst all the right people who you know where who is reading those things well it's the bureaucrats or the politicians who are reading it, and then they think oh my gosh this is really something important that people are really fighting back and if I could just comment on activism because when the convoy was going on they kept saying it was violent and they kept saying terrible they were doing terrible things which they weren't and then in February eco activists attack the ghost coastal uh, gas link camp um, terrorize the people there, destroy a bunch of equipment, and it's been over 50 or 60 days since this happened in February, and the police still don't have suspects. They still, the, the investigation is ongoing. They don't, they don't know who did it. That was actual um, damage, that was actual violence, and it got a pass in the media. I think there was, it was a story for about a day locally and then I think the National Post picked it up for a little bit and, and I think maybe it got a blurb on CBC or something for about 10 seconds and then it disappeared. And no one's talking about what's going on in British Columbia on the coastal gas link pipeline and at TMX, no, nothing's happening. Mm -hmm.